let me know when you're rolling. It's rolling. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. Um, so welcome to the Adelaide Microsoft IT Pro Community User Group Meetup for August. Uh, I'm Andrew Young. Uh, apologies from Brett Moffat today. Um, so let's get cracking. So the welcome to country. So we meet on the traditional lands of the Ghana people, where their rich culture and deep connection to the land have flourished for countless generations. Uh, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging, for the custodianship and wisdom that guides us on this journey of shared understanding and reconciliation. Right, um, so we have a few different topics we wanted to talk about, mainly regarding Intune, but um, well, I think we've got that teed up for next month. Um, I know we had some attendees last time requesting some topics around Dynamics or Power Platform. Um, so hopefully we'll get some some uh, speakers or some content on that short, um, lined up for you shortly. Um, but for this month, uh, I'm just going to do a bit of a combination of what happened during the Microsoft Inspire announcements. And I'll do my usual what's new, what's old and what's coming. And um, just do a bit of a recap on the Digital Workplace Conference uh, Australia 2023 that was on the week before. Okay, so just after our last meetup, um, there was an announcement for Azure AD, uh, which is now named Entry ID. Oops. As creativity and necessity evolve work beyond the four walls of an office, new flexibility introduces new security challenges. With threats growing more sophisticated and attack surfaces expanding, fragmentation and inconsistency slow you down. You need a clear view and unified protection for all of your identities and access points at the speed of modern business. Reimagine what's possible for identity and network access with Microsoft Entra, industry-leading protection for every resource and identity on any network, no matter where the future of work takes you. Microsoft Entra, secure access for a connected world. Cool, well, that was interesting. Um, so yes, Azure ID is being renamed to Microsoft Entra ID. Um, this rollout will probably take until the rest of the year for it to go through and update through everyone's tenants. So already now you should be able to see that the changes are in place. So in the admin center, it's now called identity um, and all, all the other corresponding licenses and add-ons have been renamed to Entra ID. Um, there's new identity categories. So besides the original uh, Azure AD protection and ID governance, and now enter ID protection, enter ID governance, um, and they're all part of securing your user accounts and controlling the level of access and I guess the, the way they're accessing. So it's all just in time, just enough access and having lifecycle policies in place so that um, any internal and external user accounts, um, they get prevented from accessing too much and for too long. And oh yes, so the network access piece. So there is entry internet access and private access, which are going to be part of the Microsoft Security Service Edge solution. Um, so not this bit bigger because I can't see it. Yeah, so verifying explicitly uh, using the principle of least privilege and um, the zero trust uh, network access approach. So assuming that you're breached, even if you are, aren't seeing any indicators of compromise or any bad actions, uh, just always assume that uh, it's, it's bad. Um, Moving on, so Microsoft Bing. Um, so you would have seen the current trends. So from the start of the year, um, there's been a lot of work in the open AI space. So ChatGPT, Bing Chat being one of those things that have come from it. So with Microsoft investment, it's now heavily being used. Uh, and it's been, I think it's just hit the six month mark. So.
of stuff going on in there. Um, so yeah, it's been a ride. Um, it's actually a lot of controversy around the whole using ChatGPT openly because of the putting in your own information, your PII and any company secrets, I guess. So um, it's probably not ideal using a public facing um, search engine or AI to, to, to say, oh, with any of that stuff. So uh, what Microsoft has done now with your uh, Microsoft 365 work account, uh, you can now sign into Bing Chat uh, and use what's called Bing Chat Enterprise. Uh, and this is included in your M365 E3, E5 business standard and business premium licensing. And it's also available as a standalone add-on for about $5 US per user per month. So it's about seven, $8 Australian. Um, just play a little bit of this one just to cover the bits and pieces of Bing Chat Enterprise. In February, we introduced the new Bing, your AI powered co pilot for the web that combines state of the art generative AI from OpenAI with search data from Bing. When you ask for help planning a one day bike ride in Seattle, for example, Bing not only creates a detailed itinerary, but also recommends the warmest day based on the weather outlook. Introducing Bing Chat Enterprise, your AI-powered chat for work. Bing Chat Enterprise brings generative AI to work with commercial data protection. That means user and business data is protected and won't leak outside the organization. When you're logged into Bing with your work account, Bing Chat Enterprise is enabled. You can ask it to create messaging for a new product and safely include sensitive data, such as the product specs and pricing. With each response, you are reminded that your company data is protected. You can even ask it to compare your product with a competitor. It will create a table combining your product specs alongside other products for easy comparison. Your data is protected and won't leak outside the organization. Your chat data is not saved. Nobody at Microsoft can view your data and your data isn't used to train the models. If you love Bing Chat Enterprise, stop that there. Um, so yes, yeah, just reiterating on on the fact that it's not going to use or keep uh, any of that personal data. So it's a lot, lot of lots much safer alternative to using ChatGPT or just regular Bing Chat to ask those specific questions with that kind of information. So um, if you are looking to use your internal data or documents and all that, that's where this guy comes in handy. So the Microsoft 365 Copilot. If you joined our session I think a couple. Of Months ago, and you were here in person, you would have seen firsthand a little bit of the live demo uh, gods playing there. Um, but from the Inspire event um, in July last month, um, there's a, a a lot of uh, videos out um, on on that platform to watch on demand, uh, just covering all of the new announcements. Uh, but this is just a kind of a summary of the main bits of Copilot. So I'll just play this one for you. Introducing Microsoft 365 Copilot, your copilot for work. Copilot combines the power of large language models with your data in the Microsoft Graph and the Microsoft 365 apps to turn your words into the most powerful productivity tool on the planet. It's coming to life in the products millions of people use and rely on every day. Let's see how Copilot can use your customer notes in OneNote as well as another internal document. Copilot quickly creates a first draft. You can turn your Word document into a PowerPoint presentation that you can hone and polish. Let's jump into Copilot in Excel. You start by asking Copilot to analyze the data and give you three key trends. Within seconds, you've got what you need. Triage your inbox, highlighting the most important emails to prioritize. You can draft a reply using data from an Excel file and Copilot will generate a reply for you. The real magic of Copilot happens during a live meeting. You can ask Copilot to summarize what's happened so far. You can see who said what, what points were made. You can follow a meeting and catch up to see what you missed, even if you can't attend. 
I want to show you an entirely new standalone experience. Business Chat works across all your emails, files, meetings, chats, documents, calendar, and more to turn all your data into knowledge. Now let's imagine you're working on your business strategy. You ask Copilot to pull up quarterly projections and identify related risks. Copilot gives you key data points and flags potential issues. We're deeply committed to listening, learning, and adapting with speed to help create a brighter future of work for everyone with AI. Cool. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Microsoft Inspire, it's the partner-related conference every year. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the information that comes out in here is usually uh, leans towards partner, um, but all the new products and announcements do, do apply to everyday users as well. Um, if you haven't noticed on the slide there, yes, the pricing was announced, and yes, it's quite high, um, coming at 30 US per user per month. Um, that's on top of um, your existing 365, E3, 5 standard or premium licenses. Um, you can probably compare this to using chat GPT plus, where I think that's around $20 US per user per month, and that doesn't have access to your data, uh, and there's a lot of testing and alpha and beta streams in there, but this co-pilot for 365 in particular, that's any any document that you've got inside your tenant, be that SharePoint, Teams, um, Outlook, uh, it's going to be able to have access to that based on your permissions and your existing access. So using the Microsoft Graph API, it's going to be able to deliver to you what you need based on what you're allowed to have as well. So there's not going to be random access or being able to ask it or oh, tell me all your secrets. So it's it's still um, very robust in preventing you from getting the wrong information. And I think what we didn't see, or we may have saw a little bit, it was um, being able to do visual search using Bing Chat. So now you can upload images. This is really cool. Um, so they're uploading an image of, say, a wireframe, and they're asking Bing Chat to be able to generate the HTML or the CSS code to be able to create that in a web page. And I know it's a promotional video, but that's in, in real, real life, it's probably just as fast almost in generating that content for you. So yeah, within a matter of well, less than a minute, that gave you uh, enough code to get that um, form created for you. Right, so what's new in M365? They have heard the announcement, but uh, we're finally getting M365 backup. Um, so this is a native service that they're including. So anything across SharePoint, OneDrive, Exchange, Teams, of course, um, you're out at do an in-place backup and restore service um, within the portal. And they're adding in API support. So all your existing vendors like Beam and so on, they'll have access to, to well, the platform behind the scenes and you can still do your licensing through them and use their front ends as you, if you're familiar with them, and that plugs straight into the, into the back end there to get access to the backups and restoration. Uh, it's a quick video. In the case of a catastrophic event, whether a ransomware attack or accidental deletion, you can't afford to wait months for your data to be restored. Microsoft 365 Backup gives you unprecedented speed and scale to back up and restore your mission critical business. Let's look at how Microsoft 365 Backup helps you restore business continuity after unforeseen data loss. As an IT administrator with Microsoft 365 Backup, I can set policies to back up specific SharePoint sites, OneDrives, and Exchange mailboxes. First, in the Microsoft 365 Admin Center, I click Microsoft 365 Backup. Instead of selecting specific users and sites, I'll protect the entire tenant. With a few clicks, my entire tenant is backed up in a matter of minutes, much faster than the weeks or months it used to take. In the case of a ransomware attack, I need to recover a healthy state of my data quickly. I go to the Microsoft Admin Center backup page to configure a restore. I can easily select a healthy point in time right before my company's content was affected for each protected service. I click into each service page to trigger the restore, and all three services restore data in parallel. 
After the restore is complete, my business is back up and running within hours without a dime being paid to the ransomers. Keep your data safe and achieve recovery at unprecedented speed with Microsoft 365 Backup. All right, so you can see from there, it's straight within the admin center. You can access the backups and restoration jobs. Um, I do want to see how it actually performs. So I believe it, there's a preview coming um, later this year. Um, and then I think they're looking to do a uh, release um, probably same time next year. So we'll have to learn and see a bit more there once we've got our hands on it. Uh, and hand in hand with backup, um, there is an M365 archive. As your organization's content grows, the storage of these files grows at an exponential rate, resulting in increased storage costs and longer data retention durations. Customers need more cost-effective, long-term storage options. Microsoft 365 Archive enables you to cost-effectively keep your Microsoft 365 data in place with all the same security, compliance, and search benefits as hot storage. Let's see how it works. As a SharePoint admin, I'm responsible for the life cycle of my organization's data. Over time, my company's SharePoint usage has increased. At 88% full, I expect to reach my limit within a month. I click on the Microsoft 365 Archive Recommendation button at the top of the SharePoint Admin Center. Here, I can create a policy to automatically archive all the sites that have not been used in a while. This starts a workflow that gives the site owner a chance to mark the site as active, inactive, or deleted. By clicking View Policy, I can see which sites have been automatically archived. I can also run PowerShell scripts or use the SharePoint UI to select sites containing large sets of archivable data. Here, I select an inactive site with a large quantity of data. While I know no one is interacting with this content, I still need to keep the site for 10 years. By clicking the Archive button, the site and its contents are put into an archive state within hours, saving my company money on extra storage costs. I can clearly see how much storage is being used at any point in time. The retention policy I applied to the site and contents remain in place. When the data is needed again, it can be reactivated exactly as it was when it was first archived. There's no loss of permissions, labels, or metadata. Microsoft 365 Archive enables you to bring and keep all the data you want and need in SharePoint at a price point that matches the activity of your data. You won't need to compromise on the security, compliance, or search promises Microsoft 365 has to offer. So to be honest, I'm a little more excited about this one than the last one. Um, so I'm countering a lot of a lot of clients out there who are actually getting really close to that um, capacity in SharePoint Online. So it's a really good uh, really good thing to have uh but it's taking so long and i've seen a lot of cases where um people are starting to move those files out of sharepoint and into OneDrive of you know, generic accounts and making use of that extra one terabyte or up to five terabytes for that matter um and it's probably not as good because then the, the data doesn't become as searchable or accessible um so having this in place you know archive it's side by side with your live data is really good. And... In partnership with Microsoft, BetterUp has created a dynamic experience featuring transformational stories and expert guidance to help unlock purpose and potential. Leading luminaries share their experiences and insights on elite performance. Sometimes you need other people to inspire you. Thinking about the future is thinking about how do we bring more care, more connection in the work that we do. People really become the leaders that they're born to be when they step into the things that most excite them. Get evidence-based assessments that deliver personalized insights and recommendations for growth. And try guided practices, small actions woven into the workday that build critical mindsets, behaviors, and skills. Better Up gives everyone the inspiration, insights, and actions to jumpstart peak performance, productivity, and potential. For you, for your team, for your organization. Start your journey today. Right, so that's uh, another thing that they're adding into the Microsoft Viva Insights email. So 
coming soon. You'll see at the bottom of those emails that you should be receiving uh, if they haven't been disabled uh, in your tenants. Um, so usually those emails include things like, uh, how has your quiet hours been spent? Are you getting interrupted in those hours? Um, what, what are your meeting trends? Um, how much time do you actually have to kind of recover in between all those engagements as well? So at the very end of these emails, there's going to be this extra link to go off and review some kind of motivational, inspirational videos, um, all included within Microsoft Viva Insights. And, um, yeah, so there you go. So scroll down to the bottom of the email and there'll be a link to watch the videos. Okay, so what's new for the partners? Um, of course, what wouldn't be complete with another rename of a product. So the actual cloud partner program is now the AI cloud partner program. Um, just to be in line before the innovations in uh, artificial intelligence. So if you went away, you are now. Um, project all that. Your customers' needs are constantly evolving and changing at an unprecedented pace. With many customers to support, it can be challenging. I'll pause that one. Um, so project all and was in preview previously for the partners. Uh, it was a feature within the Microsoft 365 Lighthouse. Uh, it gives you insights into what a client is and isn't using, um, particularly in what they're not using, because this is where all the opportunities arise. Uh, so you can then focus on if they need Teams adoption or if they need particular licensing. Uh, so it give you a, kind of a one plane glass to see all this. So it's now called Sales Advisor. Uh, and you can find out more from that link there. I'll resume this video for you. It lets me. To proactively address each of their unique needs. However, with the help of AI, we are bringing partners the data, insights, and recommendations needed to better serve your customers and not only address their needs, but anticipate them. Introducing Sales Advisor, the new experience available in Microsoft 365 Lighthouse. With Sales Advisor, reimagine how you go to market, putting Microsoft's understanding of millions of customers to work for you. It guides you toward valuable opportunities to intentionally nurture your customers, empowering you to focus on the highest value opportunities. Your team is equipped with the best actions to take, expanding your customer engagements beyond acquisition and renewal. Leveraging Microsoft's data and AI capabilities Sales Advisor provides you with personalized and actionable recommendations that can help you deliver value to your customers at every stage of their journey. Whether it is suggesting the customers to reach out to, the most relevant offer to present, or the most effective way to address an issue, Sales Advisor helps you optimize your customer interactions and increase satisfaction and loyalty. Sales Advisor is more than just a tool to help you sell more. It is a way to transform your customer relationships and deliver value at every touch point. With Sales Advisor, you can understand your customers better, nurture them proactively, and deliver value consistently. Take the next step in leveraging AI to power your business with Sales Advisor, now available in Microsoft 365 Lighthouse. Cool, yeah. So I've had a quick quick look at that one. Um, and there's a handful of clients with they're all in this very similar boat, um, different same licensing, same kind of position in their digital transformation journey. Um, so I did did see a, a large amount of um you know, drive teams use or adoption and get them on higher licensing. So I mean, it's got the right idea. Um so I, I imagine bigger partners with a larger client base may have some more um varying um, recommendations um, from the sales advisor. So I recommend you do get in there and have a look if you are a partner. Um, it is included um, for, well, yeah, it's included in it. Well, uh, well that's all for what's new, what's old. Um, anything else in red, you should probably be very concerned. Um, in highlight there, I've got Windows Server 2012, which does go out of end of supported well, end of extended support um, in October. Uh, there are a couple of ways you can kind of keep getting extended um, security updates. Um, so if you migrate your server into Azure, or if you connect it to Azure Arc using the agent, um, and you'll still be able to receive those um, 
security updates and you, you do need to um, pay for a subscription to the relevant licensing. So um, speak to your, not speak to your distributors or your partners and find out what that licensing is and they'll help you out with that. Um, and there's a couple of things coming up as well. So just keep an eye on those. We'll keep these, we'll keep this list updated every month for you. Learning and skilling, um, so there's some cool stuff first. So just shout out to Adam Fowler's Microsoft portals. So if you remember, Adam was one of the co-hosts uh, for the user group. He now works here at Microsoft uh, and he has gotten pretty much every Microsoft portal in Office 365, Azure, Power Platform, et cetera, you name it. Um, if you go in there, there's, there's bound to be um, the link to get straight to that um, admin center. So we'll go in there and bookmark a couple of those handy links. Um, side by side with that, we've got uh, this Microsoft Acronyms Glossary. So the team at TPM have created a list, it's quite a rather large list of all the three letter acronyms and what they stand for. So you can work out what your CAPs, your MFAs, and, and all that are. Um, so you can also favorite, if you can favorite them. Um, Adam's portal, you can favorite the, the links out of that, but I'd yeah, recommend you jump in and have a look at both of those. Um, similarly with Azure Charts, um, this one has a kind of a glossary as well. It's got every Azure product, service, you name it. Um, just drill down into each section and you, um, it'll give you I think the links into the, the loan pages for those so you can find out more. Um, the Azure naming tool. So if you've worked in the Azure space, you know that um, a naming convention is very important. Um, so starting from the subscription level uh, to the region, to the resource, to resource group rather, uh, and then what the resources are. Um, having a consistent naming convention helps because you will end up having a lot of resources to name and they all look very similar and end up being named very similarly as well. So have a look through that one as well. Um, there's an aim for the future with Microsoft Dynamics 365 um, promotion event, whatnot, whatever you want to call it. Um, so hit that link up when I learn more. And just want to spotlight this this person here. So Christine Kolodziewski, um, I believe that's a Polish surname. Um, she is a Power Platform MVP. Uh, she's probably better known for her work with having really cool looking UI UX um, behind Power Apps. So if you ever touched Power Apps, you've noticed that the default templates are pretty clunky, blocky, dull colors. Uh, what she's doing is making it glow up and look pretty, pretty fancy. Um, I should probably bring up something to show you. See if this one works. I do this. Yeah, well, assuming the music doesn't come with. So I assume the music doesn't come with that, but you can already tell um, with like the, the interface on the left-hand side, there was you know, gradients and different fonts and it just looks a lot better than the default um, uh, template and palette. So um, have a look for her stuff. Um, she's got video channels and GitHub repositories where you can download some of those examples, have a play of it yourself and create some uh, really crazy looking apps. Screen back in. Sorry. All right. Continuing with learning and skilling. Um, so from August 22nd, they're renaming the Information Protection Admin uh, Cert to the Information Protection and Compliance Admin Associate. Um, they've added two new additional learning paths to the collection. Um, not too much has changed, but um, it's a, a naming thing to make it in line with what they're trying to teach you there. Uh, a bit more sad news is the certified messaging 
administrator is uh, getting retired. So you've got your last chance to attain that end of this year. And the renewal cycle, because you can renew them six months out, um, the last chance of that will be in June 2024. So if you're interested in that one, uh, make sure you go and get it. It does stay on your transcript once you do attain it. So keep that in mind. Um, and it should still be a prereq or one of the prereq uh, options to do the M365 yeah, admin expert exam cert. So, yeah. Third party surf, so Coursera's um, cybersecurity analyst professional certificate course should have already started. Um, you mentioned this last month, so pre enrollment started at the end of last month, so you may get some news on that one. Uh, Central and generative AI by Microsoft and LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is doing a little course uh, on AI and what Microsoft has behind the scenes. So that one I'll have in the links, um, share that to you afterwards. So, um, but it is it is done through the LinkedIn site. So if you've got LinkedIn, then definitely have a look into this one. And it's a list of the, well, some of the Microsoft communities out there. So Probably want to jump on to the lowdown. So that's a that's a, it's a Teams meeting, but it's uh, promoted on LinkedIn. So it's run by the Microsoft team out at Western Australia. Um, so jump on that one every week. Um, shout out to our lead user or our lead office research side user group. Um, that one's run by Daniel Brown. Uh, usually it's on the third Tuesday, so today, but uh, he's had to reschedule his out to next week. So. Uh, make sure you go to that one if you are interested in the Microsoft Defender of the Business. Um, he's got Robert Crane presenting on that piece. Um, let's just go for the, the list that goes on. So Power BI, uh, user adoption, or um, M365, bottom management of Intune, Power Apps. Uh, there's a couple of Discord servers there for the enterprise mobility security and the Power Platform communities. And there's also a information protection uh, and compliance and governments, governance rather, um, user group as well at the end there. So I'll have all these shared out to you afterwards, or yeah, you can even have a look through Meetup and find some of these. Um, so it should be pretty active. What's coming? There's the Adelaide Sex Cybersecurity Conference. Uh, it's coming up, well, I think it's Friday, I believe. Um, so if you've already signed up for that, um, I won't see you there. I've not signed up for this one, but um, there's a lot of local um, ACSC and AISA related content happening there. So if you are in the cybersecurity space, I'd probably recommend you go and check it out or at least um, find someone who's going and hear all about it from um, the Microsoft Power Platform Conference that's coming up in October. That one, I believe, is in Vegas, so I won't see any of that. Um, but should be some on-demand content afterwards. And we've got Microsoft Ignite, the big conference. Um, so that's in November. And it's a reminder that Microsoft Stream Classic retires mid-February next year. So if you haven't already um, gone through the process of migrating out of Classic to stream for SharePoint slash OneDrive, you better get onto that. Um, the functionality to save the classic, um, I think, believe that's, well, it's past mid August now, so you can't save the classic stream anymore. So when you do recording of a Teams meeting that's recorded, it's not going to go into stream. It's going to live in OneDrive or SharePoint, depending on where you've started the meeting from um, and any other content um, that you create from screen record should go there as well. So into your OneDrive. Right. Have a quick drink. The Digital Workplace Conference. Um, so this is run by Debbie Island uh, from New Zealand. So she's at the Digital Workplace Results team. She used to be called Share the Point. Um, so she's been running these conferences for quite a while now. Um, so they used to be just in New Zealand, but then she brought across to Australia as well. So I believe every year there is one. Um, Sands. COVID times, but um, they would alternate between Melbourne and Sydney, uh, as well as having it in Auckland. Um, so if you haven't gone before, I can recommend you go next next time it's on, I believe next March, maybe not March, April. Uh, we'll probably hear more about that uh, once it gets closer to the dates. But I believe it's going to be the 30th event uh, in total, maybe um, next year. So hopefully get some uh, updates on that one soon. 
Um, so I want to cross over to Melbourne for this one. Um, so that the Sofitel at Melbourne. Um, so I did attend the pre and post conference workshops. So day one or day zero, as you may. Um, Daryl Webster, um, MVP from New Zealand. Uh, we've had him on the, show, on the user group before to talk about Microsoft Loop. And again, he's had a user group, or sorry, a work group shop, workshop, workshop on Microsoft Loop, um, how to use the app itself. Um, so the new app is available. You do need it enabled in your tenant. Um, and he made us actually sign into a test, a dev tenant, and load up Loop, the app itself, um, go on the workspaces, create workspaces, create pages, um, create and use components and looping them into different apps across the M365 suite. So, yeah, some handy stuff. Um, it, the, his approach was to show you the app first rather than what was given to us, which was the components first, because as having the app in front of you and seeing the workspaces and the pages and how the components kind of fit in that, um, help you understand why you would have those loop components across those apps to begin with. So what we saw was, I think it was Microsoft Teams first in just one-on-one -on -one chats where you could add a loop component and pretty much that was the end of that um, and then they brought in more uh, cross functionality in Outlook I believe so Outlook on the web um, you can use the components uh, so they're bringing in loop components to more spaces now so last month we, we mentioned the Microsoft Teams um, interactive meeting notes so that actually uses a uh, loop component behind the scenes so you can create a, a meeting agenda um, notes for during the meeting and then uh, follow-up tasks so Loop now integrates with to do. So you can create a follow up, create a task list, and then you assign users to that. Um, they can then track it within their to do app themselves. Uh, I believe they just dropped um, Jira and another app uh, just this week or today, rather. So there's, there's more functionality being brought into the Microsoft Loop itself. So just a small handful of people in this, this session here. Um, and then moving on, so day one, I guess, the keynote. Um, so we had Debbie obviously welcome everyone. Uh, we heard from Ian Heard from Microsoft um, in yeah, in Z space, public sector, um, which really it was more of the Microsoft 365 Copilot and the innovations of AI. Um, so not not nothing new from this user group. So, uh, but it's yeah, it's good to reiterate and see it again now that it's all sort of more announced officially. Um, and then we had the, uh, the, the illustrious Ducks Raymond Syed and Avpoint um, close out the opening keynote with a session on uh, accelerating purpose-driven digital transformation. So giving a tra digital transformation is not objective. You're not just moving someone to the cloud because to the cloud is going to be a, a reason and you want to be able to do it in a way that's controlled. And um, I guess what they were trying to home in on was um, making it easy to do the right thing. So uh, I'll probably cover that a bit more in detail when I get his, his other slide. Uh, should have kept clicking through, so there's the MSD in the herd. And there's ducks. Always get really, um, Awkward photos of ducks um, when when he's on stage. Uh, it's just because he's so animated and yeah, it's always always moving around. So that's one of the rare shots where he's on top of the stage rather than out in the crowd and running around. Um, of course, he also made us get up and dance. That's his probably one of the things he's known for is making his sessions um, very interactive, um, gets the crowd moving, and it's whatever trending dances on TikTok or Instagram at the time. So. Um, into some of them. I mean, I'm going to go for a few of the, the sessions I attended. Um, so you may note that I picked out the, the ones run by Microsoft MVPs just to, just to say hi, essentially. But um, you know for sure that they've got some good content. But I also believe that more than half of the speakers were MVPs. Um, the, the remainders were either Microsoft staff or distributors and vendors and stuff like that. So we had Kirsten McGrath, who we've had on before, and Megan Strant. Um, so they discussed driving sustainable M365 adoption um, based on the product itself and the people. 
So they touched on learning modalities. So this is you know, the visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and tactile learners and just their methods of learning and how they learn best. Uh, and then going into the design, the learning design models. So there's something called the ADDIE model um, that goes across um, analysis, design, development, implementation. I lost my mouse. Um, and then uh, evaluation, of course. And then uh, there's the learning experience designer, um, which is the other model that Megan um, suggest, well, recommended. And this is focusing more on the learner's needs to start with, uh, what the learning objectives are, the content, instructional design, delivery platforms, and then having learning communities. So you want to follow up and have you know, a team of people who can then train the remainder of the team and train the trainers. Um, and then there's the learning framework, the 70 20 10 uh, learning framework. So that's learning 70%, I guess, of your learning should be through experience. Like actually, while you're working, 20% uh, is learning for exposure. So learning with others or shadowing other people when they're doing the work. And that last 10% is formal learning. So just going out for paid training and doing courses and stuff like that. So having those three different sources of, I guess, education uh, is going to give you the best um, learning experience. So that was their talk. We had Rebecca Jackson, who's also been on the user group before, um, to talk about the Microsoft Teams avatars. Uh, her session was on creating more engaging um, experiences with Microsoft 365, so particularly with Microsoft Teams meetings uh, and I guess we were engaged as well. So um, kind of setting the ground rules there and what your rules of engagement are. So making sure that your meetings are inclusive, um, having, you know, making sure that yes, there's subtitles or there's slides, there's links and stuff like that. So making, covering every type of, I guess, access so it's an accessible meeting as well. Um, second point that we're making important was um, the end meeting button. So if you are the last person to leave, um, the meeting may not necessarily finish. Um, so the meeting organizer can go end the meeting for everyone because if you if you're the, if you're the organizer and you've left, um, chances are there's still attendees in that meeting and you know, what happened, what goes on in there isn't controlled. So it can lead to some sort of bad things happening. So it's important to be able to finish that meeting there so that there's no chance of that happening. Uh, and of course, having moderators, which I would uh, I would benefit from myself. Um, so having someone as like a, you know, sitting behind the scenes, watching the chat, making sure things moves moves move smoothly. Um, I know Pete's doing a good job of that um, in, in his back room there, just letting people into the into the meeting. So so it's good to have um, moderators plural, um, just being on top of that. And um, yeah, so instead of having I guess meetings or like larger meetings with a lot of people, you could just have an Ask Me Anything AMA event um, or just a post running and be engaged. Um, you could do it in a Microsoft Teams channel, but um, you know, the Engage itself has more of a different flow on. Um, so the, the, the experience for that's probably a little bit better. You can have you know, proper Q and A, you know, polling and votes and. I guess the important thing is being able to mark which response is most useful or mark as an answer or whatnot. So depending on which Viva suite application you have, um, you could have a different AMA experience. Um, so yeah, that's just another option to have besides having meetings with everyone in it. So uh, meetings are, are great and all, but sometimes you don't need everyone for that long. So you know, something that could have just been an email or a Teams message, um, you can have an AMA instead of Teams meeting as well now. Okay, um, so then the awards dinner, so there's some food, um, some awards going out, some really great people there, I can make out there, but Chanda, Chanda Ram from um, KPMG, did some really good work there with the communities in India. Um, and then we've got Shell Mannering in a very zoomed out photo there. Um, there's me with ducks and there's, um, the oh, small Peter McCallum Cancer Center Community Communications Team winning an award for um, 
the intranet changes there. Um, of course, there was also a award for the most game game change biggest game changer. I believe that was a community vote. So um, during that opening keynote and mention, um, some of the vendors came on board onto the stage to just do like a elevator pitch. Uh, I believe it was between Earth Point, Rapid Circle, and I forget one, but uh, Rapid Circle did win that one. So good on them. Um, so next, day two. So in, early in the morning, we had um, Ducks do his other sessions, so operational governance and sustainable adoption. So we focus on this one a bit more. So some of the content from his keynote session was kind of reiterated in this. So he did say that there was five points in total. He only mentioned two, I believe, in the, in the, in the keynote. So you've got all five here. So um, the first step of approaching um, governance and the adoption is to meet people in their own leanness. So there's a screenshot of the book, well, I've actually a screenshot of his slide of the book, um, so the power of loneliness. And to quote there, that of loneliness, each of us stands in a spot in the world only you stand in a function of your history and experience, visions and hopes. So it's written by Nilfer Merchant. Um, they've recommended we read this book, um, but Essentially, every person is um, fairly important there, but uh, you know, your, your experience is going to be your own. Um, so you're going to come out and, I guess, engage with these businesses and just being able to identify you know, the requirements, what, 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 where they're where they're at, and kind of where you, where your starting point should be. So um, being able to, you know, I guess, um, fulfil that or facilitates rather to them to, to them uh, and then once you've identified that you want to empower people with the relevant tools so you, we've got Microsoft 365 it's got all the apps and services so giving them the right tools or rather telling them which tools to use is probably the most empowering um, thing you can do for them because then they'll be productive and so on um, so third point making it easy to do the right thing um, Ducks' example was when you go bowling, you can put up the bumper bars. So you've got guide rails. So he, he took his um, son out there to go bowling. So when he, when they were bowling, um, the guide rails obviously helped him guide his ball down to hit the bowling pins. So it, it made it easy to do the right thing. So once he took, once the, his son got used to it, he said to take them away. So when he, when he took away the guardrails, obviously what happens is the ball goes into goes into gutter. And so they, they learned that by doing it hard, it's, it's in the first place, it's very challenging or sometimes too challenging. If it's too hard, then they're not likely willing to do the right thing to begin with. So similarly, when in IT, if, if, if you make things too hard for the end user, they may go out and try to find workarounds or delve into what's known as shadow IT and use the wrong tools outside of your control. Um, so having the guide rolls up um, in, in your tenants or your workspaces, just to, I guess, not so much prevent people from using things, but let them use what you want them to use. So that's, it gives them the right result. Um, so this is where they're talking about the governance. So they refer to it as the G word. Um, so it's it's been one of those things that I know a lot of places tend to not do upfront. So you always do do a migration or do some moves, and then then you think it's more of an afterthought. And sometimes it's a bit late, and you've already let the users have at it. So we all know about sprawl. So particularly teams where users and users um, by default can create as many teams if they want and now the latest announcements we can create you know, what it was like 2000 channels or something something ridiculous um who's no no one's going to be able to manage all that in a team um, particularly when the users themselves aren't going to manage it and so this is coming back to putting up the guardrails and preventing users from perhaps creating the teams directly so having an approval process letting it actually do the creation of the teams um, that way you've got the right number of teams and you aren't going out and having duplicates and then you're storing stuff in other team sites that you don't know of and everyone's kind of 
lot when they're trying to find the right thing. So coming back to that, yeah, making it easy to do the right thing will, will lead to a better, I guess, adoption drive. Uh, and it is part of the whole governance piece so that you are controlling what happens to, to have it all compliant in the end. Um, and that leads to the ensuring the quick wins part of that. So if they are doing the right thing to start with, then see it's a win. Um, so start with the, the easier things. So teams are one of the one of the one of low hanging fruits. So setting up the policies and, and the right governance so that the users can do that, um, do the right thing quickly. Uh, can show you the results, then the rest of the organisation will see that and they'll, I guess, catch on more quickly after that. And um, once you have gotten those champions or the, the early adopters, then you can establish learning communities. So then you have those champions teach the rest of the organization and you can even provide materials and links and other learning platforms to the rest of the organization. And having those five steps, um, it, it's gonna be pretty much what you need. Um, so it's very, very much clickbaity where you need these five steps, but um, definitely worth looking into doing or well, approaching, um, I guess, governance and sustainable adoption uh, with this, these five steps. Um, I should probably have been clicking throughout that, but yeah, so we had a, one of those polls. So what's, what's the point that comes to your mind when you think about governance and all that, so sprawl, compliance, uh, obviously at the having buy-in so yeah this, that's why you got to ensure those quick wins so the higher ups and stakeholders can see this is the right thing to do um, so then if they're on board then it makes it a lot easier to do the rest of the organization as well uh, as i said before i always catch him in funny poses but um, yeah here's five things that'll make it uh, make, make you ensure operational governance and sustainable adoption uh, and I wrapped up the conference. I always attend some of these more interpersonal sessions. So it's not just all tech. Uh, in the day, we still we still need to kind of connect with the you know, ex employee experience side of things and all that. Um, but um, Andrew Murphy had a session on just having difficult conversations. Um, and yeah, a lot of us aren't really tuned to have these. Um, there are books and stuff out there, but he's actually um created the business of being able to teach tech leaders this kind of process of having a difficult conversation so he himself actually started off um as a team lead uh, early days uh with very little experience in being a team and when a difficult conversation arose so he had um they, I think they just hired a new staff member who was either not great others or his methods weren't great so um, one of his better existing staff uh, came to him and kind of complained and said you know got to do something about this so that was a difficult discussion or conversation that he didn't actually have with the person in question so that so then his you know, his prize employee left not long after that so it's kind of learned from that you got to have these uncomfortable conversations promptly as well, uh, otherwise you know, bad things will happen. So his main points there were to be comfortable being uncomfortable, because um, it's gonna be uncomfortable for both sides of that conversation, um, to be confident, and, but not comfortable, right? Just to confuse you there. So you have to be comfortable being un in those uncomfortable situations, but you need to be confident, but not comfortable during the conversation. Uh, and then it comes down to your mindset and preparation. Well, I guess preparing your mindset as well. Um, so you're going into the conversation, you, you, you kind of asking yourself you know, why are you gonna, what's in it for you, and what what could the other party say uh, in retort or retaliation or response. So, um, and then preparing for the conversation itself. So. Um, it does say that being better prepared doesn't necessarily mean that you're manipulating the other person. It's just that you're going in knowing this is what we're going to talk about. These are the you know, outcomes and you know, this, this is how we're going to handle potential um, you know, discussion points during that. So, um, and other things were like he mentioned, you know, don't, don't say it like five 
4, 5 p.m. on a Friday because um, chances are no one's going to actually you know, come back to you um, or you, you've let, left someone with that sense of dread over the weekend. Um, so probably having a prompt and in an ideal time uh, would be best. So again, with all these and the extra sessions I did go to, um, I'll provide this, the, all the links, um, some of the slide decks, I'll figure out how I'll share those. But um, yeah, it was definitely a good experience to go to a conference um, like this. It's been, what, a couple of years? I think the last, last event I went to was in Sydney in 2020. That was the Ignite tour. So it's, it's been a few years. Um, the amount of people that went to this pales, uh, what's, yeah, nowhere near as many as went to Ignite, but it's, it's still good to have a large number of people um, attend this one. Uh, and then uh, you know, it's the, the day after, so day day four, day three, whatever you want to call it, so post-conference. Um, so Peter Carson, uh, president of Vision, Envision IT, uh, he's got a product called Extranet User Manager as well. So if you've got um, access to it, uh, or if you saw the Digital Workplace Conference website, you would have seen that there's a sign-in button. Um, so the attendees could then sign in with their work accounts, and that created a guest user account in, well, whatever the tenant was behind the scenes. So um, his other product there is uh, to help you integrate that kind of self-service within your website. So you can have people come in, they'll sign in, and they've got yeah, the external user account created in the back end, and then you can sign in and access resources granted to you. So essentially what they gave us through that was um, kind of a little portal uh, access. So you can see the sessions in the, in the agenda and then create your own agenda and build up that watch list of what you want to attend. Uh, that's also where they uploaded the slides for us to access afterwards. Um, but you know, it, it, use cases out there, you can have you know, a SharePoint site with some document libraries you want to share out exclusively to a certain community. Um, so you can have a website or web page with that integration there so then they can sign in with um, their work accounts or their Microsoft accounts, etc. Self-service, um, they get a they can sign in with that ID and they get access to that library or those whatever you've Given that access to in that in that process, so a little bit of automation, but um, uh, yeah, have a look through, look online for Extranet User Manager. Um, so the workshop itself, um, not so much on that. Um, it was more about Teams First information architecture and governance. So really, what we've been doing a lot um, for those that have been playing in the SharePoint space is to kind of design the information architecture, so where, where are your sites, where are your libraries, where do they link, and then your navigation. Um, whereas with having Microsoft Teams now is more of the focus or the focal point for your collaboration, you, there are a lot of people who are coming out and planning around Teams itself. So creating those Teams obviously creates a team site in the background, so you've got your, your repository for files and images and stuff they share in that Teams channel. So you know, how are how are they managing the expectations in the navigation around that? So sometimes, well, in, in my experience, I, I kind of do both at the same time. So you, you do work out this is your architecture. You want these sites to be attached to a certain hub site, and then you can kind of teamify uh, those team sites if you want to after the fact. Um, but you know, in, in some instances where you do know I need this team. For example, you'll create the team, it creates a team site, and then you can associate that to the hub afterwards. Uh, just some of the examples in that. So, um, yeah, it was a bit just good to kind of hear and see what other businesses and um, all that are doing um, in that space. Um, so there were a couple of a uh, couple of them in that uh, work group workshop that. Um, shared I guess the high level um, architecture that they're experiencing or have designed and slowly implementing and um, I guess now they're discovering after the fact um, because when you start these journeys and you know, new things come out so they hadn't heard of shared channels and teams so they had general public channels and then they had maybe private channels but they didn't know that there were shared channels so these are channels that can exist across multiple teams um, and they got a separate you know, security layout, they've got a separate 
private SharePoint site in the background. So you can you can kind of see there where they, they had a kind of aha moment when they realized, oh, we could have put it on like this and that would have saved them perhaps duplicating you know, the, the current architecture. So having the same kind of location created multiple times, you can have duplicate data and it's just a bit of a mess. But if you've got one consistent location across multiple teams, then different different members of different teams can actually jump onto that if they're a member of that um, share channel um, access list. And you can see and work on the same things, even if you're cross departmental. Um, I guess the other thing is if, you're, if you've got external people coming in as well, but um, their example didn't have external one, I believe, so it was all internal staff. But again, with external people, you can also work them into your existing intranet. Um, yeah, so that was that was that, and I think this one. So yeah, so I had the workshops on floor thirty-five, which is also where the bar is. But um, yeah, obligatory, everyone that went went there um, that was on the thirty-fifth floor and went to the men's room, uh, for example. I don't know if the women's or ladies had a had a had a view like that or not, but yeah, you know, having a having a rather large window um, like that in the toilet is a bit scary i guess um so i just hope they're well-behaved patrons there that aren't throwing people around uh and then yeah the night light night the night view is um, pretty good from up there um taking an iphone 12 pro um yeah uh, so yeah i would really like to attend you know, subsequent ones i uh, might even have a chance or maybe look into presenting at one of them if there's a other topic but um, or even get to Auckland to attend the, one of the ones over there. Um, so, yeah, I rambled a bit there, but, yeah, I'll have the, the links out um, probably through my blog site, uh, and I'll share it on LinkedIn. You can get to it through there, and this session has been recorded, so if you need to catch up on anything that was said during it, um, it should be on YouTube as well. Um, aside from that, um, here are some of the links for me. Um, so that'll be my blog top there. Um, see me on Twitter slash X, um, and then yeah, there's my LinkedIn as well. Alrighty, just pop this up now. I'm sure I'm gonna go back. Um, so yeah, so f thanks for listening in on the just, you know, rambling about the last couple of weeks or months. Um, if you got any questions please throw them out uh, or any discussion points. Um, yeah, so I believe we've got a session on Intune or at least application packaging next month. Um, so if you're interested in that one, um, yeah, definitely sign up to it. Make sure that it's got some good, uh, I guess, notice on that one when it's ready. So I'll have a chat at the Brett when he's got it more back on board and we'll get something out there, um, yeah. I'll stop the recording now. Thanks, Andrew. No worries.